This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I was asked to start off with a little bit of a review of the current model of service system for people with developmental disabilities in California. And um, throughout California, there's 21 regional centers that provide services to about 180,000 people who have developmental disabilities. Our service system is really uh, based on a case management model. Uh, which is a very effective way of, of assessing people's needs, matching them to services, and paying for those services through vendor agencies that, that, that you know, the system is working with. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's within our, within our service system, most people's needs are being met actually quite well. And the, you know the satisfaction that, that people report within our system, service system is, is, is you know is, is, is good, um, but there are some structural limitations with the case management model, and so we wanted to kind of go through those, and then we can compare them to what the you know what is the advantages for some people that self determination will offer within the case management model. In order for it to be effective, um, there needs to be uh, services that, that match up with the needs of the people who, who are relying on that system. And those services, again, have to be within the vendored arrangement that, uh, you know, that the case management model can pay for. Within California, in order to meet the needs of, of developing someone's you know, life through the lifespan of, and for, for all the, the different types of developmental disabilities and the needs that, that, are, uh, that, are, that are expected for this uh, system to, to meet, especially given the geographic and cultural diversity with, within our state, it's a very tall order. Um, Within, you know, some of the structural things that you, that we'll see is that in urban, uh, in urban environments, there may be very good services, but they may not meet the cultural sensitivity and and have staff who who can speak the languages and um, and who can meet the, the cultural needs uh, that that are that are you know. That the people need within that within within their that catchment area. In rural areas, even basic service needs may not exist. Um, in best situations, there may be very good services available, but the waiting list may be so long, or that they may be so impacted that that they don't meet the full range of, of people's needs that they could serve. One of the other structural limitations is that, again, within a case management model, you have someone who's assessing needs and making a judgment about what type of service would be most appropriate to meet that need. And in many situations, and I hear this, this concern frequently from people with disabilities and their family members, the service coordinator's evaluation and decision about what type of services would meet that need don't oftentimes correlate with the vision that a person with disability or their family have for their life. And so, that's, so that, you know, that top-heavy structure of, of having someone who's making that decision is, can, can be a problem. And one other structural issue with this is the fact that in order for case management to be truly effective, 
you need to have caseloads that are low enough that people can really get to know the needs of the client, that there can be a rapport that's developed so that the client feels comfortable expressing their needs and expressing, especially when things aren't working well, being able to call when there's a problem. Um, and caseloads in our, within our system are definitely stretched. And um, so that's another structural issue that, 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 you know, that we're seeing. Within um, what's the, the, the point regarding the direct service staff, within, within our model, we are, we are seeing, again, this is a structural issue. It's not that there's anyone who's, who's not doing their best. But the reality is, is that, is that at the payment rate that agencies are, are paid, that the direct service staff oftentimes tend to be young, they tend to be inexperienced, and they simply can't afford to financially to work as a direct service staff for, for a long period of time to develop their potential. So many people who I talk with, again, with disabilities, Will, will tell me that, that they are, they're feeling like they're in a revolving cycle of constantly training new staff, constantly catching up to speed. And, 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 with, and at some level, that is a structural issue within, within this case management model that we're working with. Um, and again, the, the, the limited service options that, that, can, that, that, can, that can be arranged. And, and that's simply because within a case management model, again, there needs to be a financial type of arrangement so that uh, the, the types of services that, that the person needs, that they have a way of getting reimbursed. So, so these are all structural issues. And again, I want to emphasize that, that our, our system is not broken. But our system is challenged, and, and having a one-size-fit-all case management uh, service delivery model um, doesn't fit everyone's needs, especially um, with our young generation of people who have, who have expectations that they will live very inclusive lives, that they will live uh, that, that they will not be shoehorned into a um, board and care day program or workshop type of structure. So they are looking for ways to create their own service, to create their own vision, and to, to find ways that, that they can find services that will match their needs as compared to feeling that they have to, to, to confine their life into the services that are available. So these are the structural issues. Self-determination actually started in 1994. The genesis of, of the whole self-determination movement started in 1994 in New Hampshire with the closure of developmental centers. And the families within who had members in the developmental center were very concerned how they were going uh, how to, how their loved ones were going to receive the type of intensive and specialized care that they were receiving within the center once they moved out. And they really realized that if they blew up those boxes and said, we don't have to replicate this, and with the amount of money that it costs to support someone in a developmental center, which is quite expensive. If, if we had access to that money, we could find very creative ways of meeting this person's needs in a very, you know, in a very uh, inclusive environment, uh, giving people a lot more choices in what they did, and still meet their, not only their basic needs, but, but their desires as far as what they would like to achieve. Within California, we joined the self-determination movement in 1998. By the time that California joined the self uh, I'm sorry, self-determination model, uh, uh, there were 30 states that, that, had, that had already started their self-determination model as well. California was the only one that did that through legislation through the passage of SB 1038. Um, Self-determination started uh, actually being implemented in 1999, 
Uh, there were three regional centers that were chosen. Up in the uh, northern coast, there was Redwood Coast Regional Center, which serves a very rural population. There was Tri-Counties Regional Centers down, um, down in the Southern California, and East Los Angeles Regional Center, which serves a very multicultural uh, uh, population. So th three different regional centers were chosen in different parts of the states that have different needs. And, the, uh, and they were matched. Uh, it was a partnership between the regional centers and this, uh, the uh, area boards on developmental disabilities. So it was a partnership. The regional centers and the area boards were given the ability to, um, to, 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 to find their own way with self-determination. So each, each regional center was said, this is our goal. This is what we would like to do. And you, know, you, you develop the best structures that you can, which gave, again, a, a wonderful opportunity for us to identify some best practices, some weaknesses, and you know, things that, that, that we can improve. Uh, you'll notice that there were two other stars, the silver stars. Uh, we had Kern County Regional Center and San Diego Regional Center that decided to join in self-determination. Um, not within the actual funding model, but, 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 but they, but, but they did, did the self-determination as well. The numbers of people, uh, it was a voluntary service, that self-determination will always remain. And the numbers that were served ranged about 30 people per regional center. So it was not a, a, huge, a huge test, um, but, but I think an effective one. So we talked a lot about self-determination without saying what it is. Um, the idea, the basic idea of self-determination is that you would take the budget, the full budget that a person was allocated in the prior year or if there was a situation to where needs had dramatically changed, then you could kind of take a look at what the standard for that type of need would be. So, and you, do, you are granted that budget. Obviously, it doesn't go directly to the person. It's going to go to a financial management service uh, who's going to oversee it. Um, <clears throat> or in this case, they were in, during the pilot, they were called fiscal intermediaries. Um, the entire year's budget was, was deposited, and, and it was really left up to families to figure out, and to, to the person with a disability, their family, their support team, to figure out and, and to really reimagine what are my needs, what are my goals, who could I hire to get me there. Um, so we had the fiscal intermediaries who received the full amount of money. Um, that was a requirement. Obviously, again, they can't legally receive the money directly. Uh, and we're obviously going to work in almost reverse order here. <laughs> they also had the option of having an independent support broker. Um, East Los Angeles Regional Center, uh, as part of this of studying uh, how self-determination, uh, you know, was working, they found that that to simply set the budget, identify the goals that people had, and to think of, and and to to hire the people who were going to help, it took four months on an average. It took four months, thirteen meetings. 40 hours, okay? That was simply to get the picture started and to, and to, and to, to start to implement it. Obviously, um, there, were, there were ongoing meetings after that. So it's, it, it, this is a very time intensive, um, very much a, uh, actually going back to the way that the Lannerman Act truly envisioned people having intensive, uh, uh, intensive family and support, uh, support and, and planning that would happen. Um, I've, I laughed because, again, this is going back to 1998, and uh, one of the service coordinators, when they saw how long it was taking to develop this, they, at that time, uh, they, uh, the average case of was 62. 
regional centers now tend to have caseloads about hovering around 100. Um, when, the, when the case manager um, kind of broke down their duties and said, how much time do I have per person per month? It, they found that they had about an hour and a half per person per month. So, so the service, the independent support broker, really is an, a, a, an important role. Not that everyone used it. Uh, some people, again, they chose to use a circle of support, you know, involving you know people from all walks of life, and they were able to do it without without using a service broker. But, but most people did, I, uh, at least initially. Um, again, within that. People had their year's worth of their budget that was granted to them. They had that direct that direct control over the budget. Um, the one thing that I would like to mention is that again, the independent support brokers those are optional. So the fiscal, the financial management service or fiscal intermediary, intermediaries. Um, they have extra responsibilities. It's not just simply managing the budget. They would also make sure that uh, people, uh, when they hired people, that, that they, they were following the correct procedures. They were making sure that, that any kinds of, of, you know, if someone was fired again, correct procedures were followed. Uh, making sure that people that the taxes were paid, so all of those things fell within the fiscal intermediaries or financial management services. Um, so that's 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 the basic structure there. Again, going back to when when this first thing uh, when self determination was first started, there were three basic things that they wanted to test. They wanted to see how power shifted away from the very powerful case, you know, case management system and how people adapted to having that amount of power over their life. They, they wanted to test whether or not lives truly got better. And the basic requirement was that costs needed to stay either the same or that would be, be reduced. Um, <clears throat> initially, actually, it was it was interesting because um, it was it, there were some people who wanted to state that that the cost would absolutely go down. And what was interesting is that when they did when they did studies, they found that that many people actually did spend less than than, than their full budget, and and really felt that that their lives were quite a bit better. So um, so. It's not something that that I, I think anyone should guarantee, but but I do think that um, that that you could certainly have some very creative and exciting kinds of changes in your life uh, for the same cost that that um, you know that that you, that you had been um, spending prior to to self determination. One of the things that makes this a little bit tricky. In the pilot projects, the case, the uh, financial management services and the service brokers were both paid for through outside grants. Uh, we'll talk about the fact that that changes uh, with self-determination when that's going to begin uh, next year. So, so, so some of the results that, that people um, that, that people had under the pilots are going to be slightly different uh, once once we start implementing it statewide. So, one of the things that that they wanted to be care very careful for when they implemented self-determination in the pilots, and and this is something that's also being spelled out within. The, uh, the expansion that's going to happen next year. They wanted to make sure that everyone had a chance for self-determination, that there was not some select groups that were receiving it and some groups that weren't. They were selecting for, to make sure that, 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 that each one of these things were, were represented, age, gender, a good mix of, of ethnicities, uh, the full range of intellectual disabilities, uh, people living either at home, within group homes, or uh, within, 
oh, supported or our individual, our, our ILS programs. Um, they wanted to make sure that they included, you know, the full uh, uh, range of major disabilities outside of the intellectual disabilities. And they also wanted to make sure that, that, that they had a good mixture of people who were conserved and, and who were unconserved. Uh, so there were controls within this, and again, this is going to be uh, one of the things that that will be that will be a factor when they open up self determination to a broader population next year. Within self determination, during the pilots, they wanted to to not just have anecdotal information, so so they did. Uh, they did do an, in, an intensive, um, an intensive pr process of, 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 of measuring the, uh, the you know, uh, how how behavior issues uh, were affected during when people entered self determination, productivity, choice making, integration, uh, the in individual planning process, the budgeting connection with family and friends, perceived quality of life changes. It was really interesting reading the, um, some of the reports that came from this. I had no idea the types of, of, um, of indicators that are out there and this, for, for all these things. And, and one of my favorite was an integration. And I like the fact that, that the integration one really focuses not just whether or not people are in the community, which is one of my pet peeves, but whether or not people were, were a part of the community. And so I really I, uh, plan on exploring the integration uh, indicator that's, that's out there. But, but uh, if, if anyone's interested in some of these indicators, I can, I can get these to you later. But I had no idea, truly, the number of these types of, of, of tools that are available to assess uh, these. Um, we'll get into outcomes uh, in a later slide. One of the things about this planning process, we talked about the fact that, that the planning process, when people enter self-determination, that it needs to be a very, um, a very intensive and, very, uh, and, and, and a process that includes a lot of people. Again, in the, self, in, the, in the case management type of model, you don't really have to do a lot of this. Your needs are assessed. You are matched with a service that, that, that someone deems would meet those needs. In this case, you're not only uh, you're not only reassessing your needs, but you're also again you're reassessing, you know, what kinds of things do if if I didn't need to, and since I don't need to rely on just vendored services, what kinds of things can I do if I can hire anyone I choose to do anything I want to do? What would I like to do different than I'm, than I'm doing now? Um, so one of the things I'll appreciate, and you can see this when you see, uh, when you see Willie's slides, um, you'll see the type of plans that, 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 he, that he developed. And, and one of the things that the case managers noted was that the plans were, were thoughtful that they were innovative, that, that they included pictures, they included, um, they, they included multiple ways for people to think about their lives and make choices for their lives. Uh, plans were, were, were in plain language, in, in, uh, which, which gave people a much better ability to plan what they truly wanted to do instead of, you know, again, when we hear the jargon, it kind of puts a box around, what, you know, around our thinking. The plans were, were something that were active guides. If I asked most people today, where's your IPP or your IEP, they would have to go dig them out of a drawer if they had them at all. These plans were, were out, in, you know, out on the table. They were referred to, <laughs> and they were active guides. Um, and one of, the, one of the case managers noted that, and, and this was in one of the very rural areas, they, they were talking about this point about service brokers were responsive. They were talking about the fact that, again, this was an area where, uh, where the actual vendored services were pr pretty much non-existent. 
and they they were they were you know they were talking about it was amazing the type of things that the service broker was able to put together by hiring people who were who were in you know who were local and who knew the person and 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 had expertise in the in the things that the person was 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 interested in i was um, you know, talking to Kobe, the uh, the artist out um, who, who was in, in our exhibiting hall, uh, about his photography, and uh, one of the things that I oftentimes think about with with micro enterprises like that, uh, we have um, the, the people who they have to hire the, uh, for for their support staff. Again, very dedicated people, but they're not photographers. And they're not entrepreneurs. <laughs> and, and so one of the challenges that we have when we're trying to, to again, to match people's needs with, and their vision with staff is the fact that, um, that the people that, that are in our system, they, again, they're willing to support, but it's not their passion. It's not their, their true knowledge base. We've got social workers trying to do business. And so, in this in, in this situation, you know, it was even it was even harder because again, it was a very rural area, and and um, in the past, this person had really had very few options, but the service broker was able to put something together that really worked for that person. One of the things that that jumped out in doing the research about uh, about the pilot. People were shocked. People with disabilities and their families were shocked about how much money was being spent on their services. Um, you know, and you, th you think about it, and again, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing underhanded that's happening here. Um, but, but when you have services, you know, there's ob obviously, you know, the, the financial, the, the administrative overhead, you know, and, and other things that, that are required. Um, and so when people saw it, it's my gosh, I, I, my budget is, you know, several hundred thousand dollars a year. And, and, uh, and, and they started to really question, if, if this much money is being spent and I've moved so little in my life, um, could I do better than that? <laughs> um, and so people who, ch again, within self-determination, you can choose to continue to use standard vendors, or you can choose to use people that you hire on independently. So people who did go with standard vendors, one of the things that was uh, that they found was that that people were the people with disabilities were empowered, and they started to have much higher expectations of their daily work with the people that, th that were serving them. And it makes sense. When you start to understand, wow, this is so many dollars per day, I really, I, I need to step up my game, first of all, as a as consumer, and make sure that, you know, that I'm making this day count. But I also am gonna have higher expectations. Um, with outcomes, one of the, the, the one of the, um, case examples, uh, a man uh, who was, had been in, in a workshop, um, actually stole away his, one of his support staff, who, who was someone that, that, that had always, uh, he had, had always uh, been of good support to him, uh, hired him, you know, directly, and within a very short period of time, he found he, he, he found a competitive employment that, that matched what he wanted to do. Um, and one of the things that, that you see repeatedly, uh, and if you, as you read the evaluations from self-determination, was how powerful it was for people to have the control over who they hired, to have the control over truly, um, truly, Directing them and training them the way that they felt, um, and and the ability to retain those staff, 
of under self-determination, uh, at least within the pilot again, that there were no extra expenses. People had the full amount of their budget. And they were able to sometimes increase the direct service uh, staff's salary by 70%. And I say that with a word of caution, because what you're talking about is you're talking about just the hourly pay. And, and, and uh, you're not gonna be, you're, that's not gonna include things like vacation, sick time, tr extra training. Those are all things that, that may not exist. One of the things that, uh, my personal experience, uh, I work for the last 20 years. I've supported a man uh, with a developmental disability, uh, in, with 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 his with his everything from staffing to 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 uh, the types of things that he does in the day. He, as a child, he uh, he did have regional center services, and he could have reapplied for those, but he had a large enough trust that it was the decision that he a choice that he could have made. And when we sat down 20 years ago and we started talking about, you know, what is your vision? Would you like to go into, you know, to have um, some of these costs defrayed by the regional center? He, he quickly made the choice. He's so like, no, I, I really want to have the full ability to, again, hire my staff, train my staff, discipline my staff, and let them go when I want to. And I don't want to have to go through a supervisor or have anyone tell me, you know, well, give the guy another chance or something. I really want that control over myself. So um, it's, been, it's been an interesting experience. In some ways, I've had the opportunity to kind of do our, my own self-determination <laughs> with, with this gentleman. And, uh, and I've asked him occasionally, you know, do you ever regret that decision? Would you, it's obviously not a decision he's locked in. He could, he could change that at any point. And he's never, ever thought, you know, that he would want that level of control taken away. Um, some of these things we covered within the structural uh, limitations of a case management mo model. Um, but within self-determination, they, they found all of these things to be true. There were, an, with, within, uh, within, uh, Areas where there were a lot of there was a lot of culture diversity, they found that an, that people had an awful lot of unspent money because they they had not found services that again met met their their, their cultural needs. Um, they found areas that um, th that are what what I call service deserts to where again you know rural areas this is obvious, but but there's also service deserts that exist even in um, even within, you know, uh, with, within areas that have the same, um, with, with, with the same population kind of things. I, I look at the difference between Sacramento and some of our surrounding areas that are, that are, that are cities of sizable things. And I have to say, Sacramento is actually very, very blessed in terms of the, the range of services that we have here compared to many of our other surrounding areas. So it's not just an issue of population. Of, and you know, I'm not really sure why some areas have, uh, I have my guesses, okay. Um, waiting lists are obviously a problem, as well as service denial, which can happen again when, when either case managers have a different vision um, or sometimes one of the things that will happen is that case managers can be very intimidated by the process of going before the committees in order to get certain services. So, so, so these were all things that were identified within, um, with, within, the, uh, within the pilot project. And these were issues that they found in many ways were alleviated by going through the self-determination model. Within self-determination, the one of, one of the challenges that people are gonna face is the direct service, the direct staff recruitment. You think about it, one of, the, one of the comforts of our current model is the fact that if we have a staff that quits, the agency simply sends someone else in. Under self-determination, you have your direct service staff. And if something happens, you're not gonna have a backup uh, unless you've created something yourself. 
um, with, uh, you know, that's available under our current model. So this is something that, you know, that, that, um, that people need to think about. The, um, again, the advantage is the fact that you're able to recruit anyone, as long as they pass, and Tony will talk about this later, as long as they pass the basic background check. But you can, you can recruit, you know, from outside of our, outside of our usual system. Increased use of generic resources. Again, within a case management model, there are certain vendors that, that are approved and that we have a mechanism to pay. Under self-determination, you can, you can choose to, to hire either a service or people uh, who will, um, you know, who are able to, uh, to meet your needs. In addition to just kind of the personnel issue with that, um, one of the, there's, uh, there's a great kind of uh, a pamphlet that was put together by the, uh, the State Council on Developmental Disabilities that kind of, inter that, that interviewed some people who had received self-determination services. And one of the families talked about that, that uh, their, their son needed uh, diapers. And that the regional center had a you know one vendor that they that that uh, that they used for for diapers, and and they may have been quality diapers, but they they just didn't fit, uh, and and they they just didn't work for their for their son. In ad in addition to that, they when they received self determination services, they were able to go to Costco or Winco, buy. Diapers that, that truly met this person's needs much better, fit better, and, and were more effective at just a fraction of the cost. So, so generic resources, you know, apply to both personnel kinds of things, but also, uh, you, you know, physical kinds of resources. And the services again are tailored to the the needs of the person um, in a, in a very personal way. When they did the final evaluation. Of, of the self-determination pilot, they found that the sense of freedom that that people experienced had had increased dramatically. That that they again they felt that that they weren't confined in boxes, that they were able to truly um, to truly dream and and find ways of attaining those dreams. Family members reported that they felt that they'd always been in an adversarial relationship with the area, or with, I'm sorry, with the regional centers. And that they felt for the first time that for, for, for many of the families, and again, you have to remember the people who go into self-determination are dissatisfied with the current, the current model. But for those families, they felt that they had finally entered into a partnership with, with the regional center. Incidentally, what I thought was interesting was the, the, the reflection of a case manager who felt that they were freed by self-determination because they didn't have that responsibility anymore. They didn't have the, the, the fiscal you know, needs to be stewards of, of, of the resources and that they could truly sit down and just make suggestions. And it was very interesting that, it's, that a service coordinator had this kind of this exact same you know, response as the parents felt during this, this process. Satisfaction um, uh, you know, increased, not only with the services, but the families really felt that their sons and daughters had grown during this process. There were some concerns by providers during self-determination. Um, uh, one of the things, one of the issues that pr providers uh, found in some cases was that the, the finan financial management services um, were late on their payments and didn't seem terribly concerned about that. And, and, and you know, th again, this was a situation where, where um, they were being put into a new role and hopefully over time those things were ironed out. But that was one of the complaints of, of service providers, was that they were receiving late payments. And, um, and I, have, I have actually seen uh, issues with financial management service on a pretty regular basis with our consumers, who, you know, in terms of actually finding out what their balance is and, 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 
as a matter of fact, one of the other findings that, that they found in self-determination was that oftentimes um, people who were receiving that service, that in the final quarter of the year, when they were finally able to get their balance uh, rectified, they, that their services would, would go up dramatically during that last quarter because they had been very careful to make sure that they, um, that they, um, you know, that they didn't run out of money. But also sometimes they reported that that happened because they, they hadn't gotten accurate balances from their financial management services earlier in the year. Another concern of providers is that they may be repeat, you know, competing with people who are less qualified than they are. And, and are able to provide the service uh, and are able to provide direct you know, support uh, without all of their, the regulations that, that they are held to, without uh, the, the training that they're expected to do. And so the, they, they felt that there was a you know, kind of an uneven playing field in some cases. The other issue was that, that as, as I've commented about earlier, is that, um, actually I've referred to it twice, uh, agencies typically have a problem retaining staff anyway. But under self-determination, there's the te there is a temptation at least for, for people who are exiting, exiting that system to say, you know what, I really did like this one job coach I had, <laughs> and I could, and I might be able to offer him a higher hourly salary. So, 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 uh, service providers were concerned about the fact that they may have increased staff turnover as re, as a result of people in self determination hiring their staff away from them. One of the things I'd like to just, as for service providers, um, one, is, one of the things that I would like to kind of like put out there based on, again, the, the, what, what was learned through this process was the fact that, again, the ability for people to select their staff was one of the most important things to, to people throughout this, throughout this pilot. And there are a few agencies that I know who have a commitment to, first of all, having the people that they serve on interview panels. And I, I, something that I highly suggest that any agency out there would do, because, because that ability for, for people that are being served to have that input, and not just on an initial interview, but invite people back on second and third interviews who to, to, to you know to, to try out their you know their actual work skills and have people with disabilities being you know a very important part of that. Another thing I would recommend is that you know I, I don't know if people out there have experienced this, but there is uh, many agencies feel that it's important to rotate staff from client to client on a regular basis. And, and this is oftentimes stated as m wanting to make sure that there's not an over-dependency that's built in between a staff and their support, or, I'm sorry, a client and their support staff. One of the things that, again, was identified very strongly as, as the advantage of self-determination was the ability to retain staff and the ability to, to develop that, that rapport that people Really need to be to be you know fully supported in their in, in their life, and so I'd really encourage staff uh, agencies to review and rethink if they're making that as part of their uh, as you know part of their general policy. Willie West, I, Willie West is uh, someone who has uh, had, had received self-determination services, I believe, since the very beginning, and I believe that he also uh, has. It's, I believe it's the only model that he's experienced since he's moved out of his home, and I'm very disappointed he's not here because I really wanted him to offer the kind of that nuts and bolts, you know, how things went for him, kind of a thing. The other thing that makes me disappointed that Willie's not here is that I have a, a bet with my wife. Uh, when I first met Willie, I looked, he came into a room and I was like, that guy looks just like Adam Sandler. And I turned to my wife and said, who's that guy look like? She goes, John Travolta. <laughs> so I really wanted to get 
kind of like a, a poll of which one. John Travolta and Adam Sandler. I'm not sure how those go together, but. <laughs> um, but Willie's a, a, a wonderful guy, and I and I and I hope that that uh, he's able to come uh, and 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 do future presentations on his his experience with self determination. But one of the things that is that that's kind of like highlighted within this slide is that Willie really felt feels that self determination. He can't imagine his life without it. And, and I've heard Willie several times say that he's really sad that, that the, the numbers at this point have been so restricted. So to him, you know, he really feels that, that it, it has created a life that is very different than he would have had under the traditional service. One of the things that Willie talks about here is, is the fact that um, he has a very diverse circle of support. And, and this, again, is something that, that, that is something that is very important if someone's going to enter self-determination services. You, you are needing to reimagine your life and reassess your needs. And that's very difficult to do without, without having input from, from people who have a lot of different experiences and have a lot of different connections. Um, I love the fact that you know he, he talks about you know he's had employees, he's had executive directors from uh, I know that um, Don Morley, the um, director of of the area board in his area, has been a part of, of Willie's team, and um, so so he's had the opportunity to have some very experienced people on his team, and he's also had family. I love the fact that that's included. And here he's giving kind of the overview of, of the way that, that, that he started with self-determination, with, with, again, reviewing the budget that he had had to, within the prior year of his service, um, working with a broker and, and trying to figure out the, the types of, 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 of activities that he would like to engage in and the type of staff who, who, he, could, uh, who he could hire to meet those. Um, discussing the types of, of, of things that he supports that he would need to move out of his, of his home, and again, the safety nets that, that he would need that to be in place. And again, that's something I just really feel I need to emphasize, is that people need to think about, they're not going to have just an agency saying, okay, we've got another staff to come in here. There are obviously agencies out there that, that you can that you can you know have um, you know short term you know let, uh, staff come in, um, but for, uh, but but as those, that's much more typical in terms of your living situation than it is in terms of if you had a job if you, if you were having a job coach, um, it's going to be harder to find someone who could do that on the fly for you. This is, as I mentioned earlier, this is a good example of the type of, of plans that are very different than a traditional IPP or ISP or one of our other P's out that are out there. Um, you see, uh, Willie decided, you know, to, to use this this model of, of of using pictures and 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 finding multiple ways of of, of imagining his life, his needs, and the types of supports that he, would, that, 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 he, that he could have. The goals are also quite different than you would oftentimes see in an IEPP. Uh, you wouldn't normally see someone say, you know, I have strong arms, or I want to have strong arms. But, you know, frankly, we should. <laughs> we should. We should open up our process. Uh, to you know, to really ask people, it's like, what's important to you? Not just what can this, the regional center provide for you, but what's important to you, and how can how can we make that be part of your of your goals? So, this is kind of a good example of Willie's uh, using generic resources. Um, he did research. He called around. He said, "Gosh, I'm interested in doing this. What are some typical places that that would that would meet the needs that I'm that I'm looking for?" He called, uh, he called the companies or called the agencies and say, "I'm looking for this. How much do you charge?" Um, and 
and, and goes through that, he went through that process. Um, the services charge the plan the same amount as they would any other customers. And, and so, if, you know, it, it was, a, I think, a really empowering process to go through this. And I like his last statement here. It makes me feel like I'm in charge of my services instead of someone who doesn't know me. He wasn't having to filter his dreams through our service system to say what, what would be appropriate to write onto the plan. He didn't need to filter his, you know, his dreams through someone who'd say, well, that's not really what we're talking about right now. You know, we need to focus on our services. So I really like that, you know, you know the, the way that, um, that, that the system worked for Willie. This is um, a list of some of the, the services that he, that he buys. Of course, he, he needs to, uh, to roll in the finance, financial management services. And actually, it was interesting for me to see this slide because I wasn't sure under, within people who are currently being served within the pilot if, um, if, if they were at this point needing to pay for financial management services, but they are. So, so, you know, so some of my concerns about the impact of that, uh, what, you know, it's good to see that, that he's already doing that. One of the things down towards the bottom, the advocacy conferences, um, you know, again, that's something that's, that's, that's a very creative type of thing that under our current model, um, what may not be something that that could be if, you know found a way to pay for, or some or might be difficult for uh, for under a case management model, for, you know to, uh, to to have put in your plan and have funded, but within self determination, you know you are allowed to you know to, to really set your dreams. And 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 uh, and and find the services that will allow you to do that. One of the things, while I while I'm on the slide, uh, Willie mentioned paying for the lift maintenance of the vehicle. Within the original pilot, um, the uh, people did not need to uh, to match. Um, to, to match the things that they paid for within certain service codes. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that, some, uh, that some people who involved in the very early part of the pilot had concerns about was that people, um, the families, uh, I'll give you a couple examples. One family remodeled their home so that it was more accessible to the person. Um, it's a very reasonable idea, actually, but it is one of those gray areas where people would say, What's, "Was this remodel really for the benefit of the person, and should our should the surface money have been spent for that?" Uh, another situation: a person, a family, had an unre unreliable vehicle, and the family purchased a new vehicle to make sure that they could transport their son and daughter to the you know to to the uh, events that they needed to get to. Again, that causes you know some people some 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 ease uh, unease. Um, another situation was that uh, a, a person uh, was a, a, a father uh, was uh, working in, in a job that didn't have time off, and when he would need to take time off to again take care of the needs of his son or daughter, he would use that money to reimburse himself. I think those are all actually okay kinds of things. Um, but, but it is something that you can see where people would have concerns about, uh, uh, you know, about whether or not those are appropriate use of resources and whether or not that could be abused. Again, as we talk about it, you'll see that, that those kinds of, 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 of opportunities have been closed off within, within the new model. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.